You don't watch playback, do you? No, I don't. Um, but I also, it's funny how, as an actor, you sometimes, you know what? I feel like if you have an idea, and this is probably good advice for actors that are kind of coming up or starting out in film, if you have a good idea for something, you should ask for another take. Or you feel like you maybe have something else in you that you're curious about, you should ask for another take because it will haunt you Sure. Forever. And, and even if I've done, I mean, Noah, in con stark contrast to Ryan, um, it, it is just like he's relentless and you can do, you know, 45, 50 takes of one, you know, he only uses one camera. And so you're, and he's very specific about uh, the words of the words and, you know, that that's it. And every every hesitation and every unfinished sentence and, everyone talking over one another is all completely scripted and nothing is improvised. Um, and Nothing he, is improvised in that movie? Not a single word. You guys both need Oscars. Because <laughs> I, I was like, oh, well, this is just improvised. <laughs> it's just not. Oh, my it? gosh, you can't even add in a but. You know, he'll he'll remind you. It's I, like you theater. added a button. In, what? That's like theater. It is like theater. It That's totally like was like theater. And I wanted to ask you about your experience in theater, too. Sure. Um, because you're so good. I was so, so sweet. Well, you're so, so good. It's like my only actor friend that actually came to see the play. <laughs> <laughs> um, they paid me to. Sure, sure. She's the only one who came to see me in Lobby Hero. Uh, yeah, that's right. I was like, what the hell was it called? <laughs> 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 that's right, Lobby Hero. That You were great in that play. Thank you. Um, you were so nervous before you did it. Terrified. Terrified, terrified, uh, almost terrified more in the rehearsal process just because it's a new medium and I'm surrounded by people in the show who... No one else was new. I was the only new one there. And I think I was going to try and find a new way of doing what we do. You know, after a while, the, the, the process of filmmaking doesn't get stale. You just want to try and find a new way into what has become very familiar. And I think what I was hunting for was that kind of prolonged period of time within a scene, as opposed to the, you know, action cut, action cut. Thinking that it would allow this kind of um, liberation and freedom to kind of let subtext really take over the moment. And it truly couldn't have been more the contrary. You know, when you're on stage, it's like, you know, your hair inside, you're just like, because ah! <laughs> you, have, you have so much to remember. It didn't feel like that watching you though. Well, you like were in the pocket. And I'm curious because you're so, you obviously with the, Marvel stuff, and we've worked together like a thousand and a half times at this mm -hmm. point, not just even on the Marvel stuff, but we've done a lot of other stuff together. And I think mostly everything that I've done with you are those two takes, you yeah. know, whatever, a few takes and moving on and the schedule is packed and whatever. And so I'm curious, as you, how did you find the relentless schedule and having to eight shows a week, you know, keep, digging in, like, ha did you find it um, tedious? Did you find it liberating? A lot of people told me, you're gonna have so much time, you know, you just gotta go to the theater in the afternoon, you got your whole days. I didn't find that at all. No. I, I got off stage, you're emotionally drained, you're physically exhausted, I just wanted to go to bed, and then before you know it, you're right back at the, at the theater. Um, I think, and, and I think this really is where it comes down to subjectivity and personal preference, but um, I played a villain, and, Within the play, you know, uh, Mikey, Sa Michael Sarah, who's in the show with me, is kind of the moral compass and certainly the one that you identify with as an audience member in terms of what would you do in the scenario. So as he navigates these ebbs and flows, when, when he would go through things, you could hear the audience, oh, like, you, and, and, and these bonds are formed, you know, of, of common, you know, humanity. Um, my impact on the audience was people identifying me as the person in their life that they despise. And, you know, if I'm doing my job well, they hate me, which is fine. But I think to, to, to get up every day and find the motivation to go to the theater and do it, I, I think the next time I get on stage, selfishly, I'll want just a few moments where I can find that sweet, sympathetic connection with the audience that isn't just representing the worst parts of their personal experience. You know what I mean? Because you replace, I mean, iconically such a likable person <laughs> well, that I would find, <laughs> I think we all know who I'm talking about, that yeah. 
I, I think I would imagine that that would be kind of. That was the appeal. Right. That, that, that was, that's why but I couldn't it wasn't. wait to do it. Well, it was fun, but then, you know, by like, you know, month two, you're like, man, <laughs> I, it's, it's tough to go yeah. and, and just feel this hate from the audience. Again, that means you're doing your job well, but it's, it's not going to not take its toll. And it, you're not going to not take some of this home with you, not to use double negatives twice, but it, it just, I think. Theater is such a wonderful exchange. It really is. I forget who used this analogy, and I'm probably going to butcher it, but it really is like building little sandcastles every night that the audience or the ocean just comes and takes, and then you build another one tomorrow. And that's a beautiful and tangible, fleeting part of, of creativity. And I think what keeps you motivated to come back has to be part of that exchange. And, and my whole exchange was just predicated on just loathing. <laughs> and I think it just it started to get uh, taxing. But you, I feel like when you work, you have to, no matter who you're playing, you need to f like have find some empathy for, did you, could you find empathy oh, for that me. person? Oh, trust me, you know what every actor says, that's like, you know, acting school stuff. You never judge the characters you play. If you judge the characters you play, you're not gonna play them real. So you never, see, no villain thinks they're the villain. Um, but, you know, when you, <laughs> when they start calling like things out. Oh, this fucking guy. <laughs> oh, sorry, I can't say swears. <laughs> but I, a couple times, you know, and you take a little bit of, I actually, I had a drama teacher in high school who told me he saw a performance of Othello somewhere in Texas in the 70s. And someone in the audience stood up and shot Iago. Shot him. And he made, he survived. But in the hospital said it was the most, you know, the greatest compliment he'd ever received. So, Getting those reactions from the audience knows it shows you're doing your job well, but just on a really personal, intimate note, it's it's so liberating and wonderful to be on a stage. But you really do long for that kind of shared um, uh, emotional conflict that we all go through. And and my character was so detached from any sort of morality. Uh, it, it, I don't think he, as a character, even found that connection at home with his family. So. That, that, that channel felt a little shut down. And, and like I said, over time, it just starts to feel, it weighs on you. Yeah, I can see that for sure. Hey, Benny, you wanna ask this guy some questions? All right, what is this? What's this arrangement? Mr. Drysdale. CSI KFC? <laughs> yeah, original content. It's not there very often. That is one of the best things about Knives Out. It was something that I read that felt fresh and new, and I think, it's this weird chicken and the egg thing. Who started it? Did, did audiences only start going to, you know, lowbrow stuff, so that's what we started making, or is it that we made it first and now that's all we've offered? Hey, speak for yourself. True. You know what, you, you <laughs> honestly, true, it's fair. You, you I, think, I think there's a lot of, um, it's interesting, because a couple of people actually in the past couple of days have, have mentioned to me that uh, a couple of extremely esteemed directors yeah. have been, you know, really vocal about how um, movies, you know, the kind of whole Marvel universe and these, I guess, big kind of blockbuster action movies are really like, you know, d using words like despicable and like the death of cinema. And I actually, you know, at first I thought, oh, that seems kind of old fashioned. And somebody sort of had to explain it to me because it seemed so kind of disappointing um, and sad in a way. And then, and then they said, no, I think, you know, what that, what these people are saying is that, um, you know, in at the actual theater, there's there's not a lot of room for different kinds of movies or smaller movies or independent movies because the theater is actually just taken up by these huge blockbuster yeah. movies and there's actually no space for these movies. And, um, you know, it made me sort of think about how people w consume content now and how, how there's been this huge sea change in how people where people view, what the viewing experience is yeah. and what the maybe original, what we would have called the cinematic experience, how, how that's, that, you know, that's that's definitely changed for people as everyone's lifestyle has changed. I mean, people watch, are taking in all of this different content and all these different new platforms and it just is, it's just, a, it's just, you know, it's just cha changing and I think, yeah. I think of all the stuff that's out there that has found a home in whether it's through a streaming network or service or, you know, um, you know, maybe on a different kind of television networks that are happening now or, um, you know, there's all these different ways and people 
to, to see stuff. And so all this stuff is getting made that I think would probably have never had sure. a shot before. Well, I, that's a, and it's, it really is a testament to what original content. I think original content inspires original content. You know what I mean? I think new stuff is what keeps the creative wheel rolling. Um, I mean, like TV is such a good example for that. Right now, there's unbelievable new stuff happening. Yeah. All over that landscape. Yeah. There's less risk. They're not beholden to box office results. And as a result, they have more freedom and they yeah. allow more creative minds to be in charge of the creative process and ultimately the final product. Um, I just believe there's room at the table for all of it. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's like trying to say a certain type of music isn't music. Well, wh wh why, why bother? Why, who are you to say that? It just, it just feels like a strange, you know, same team, same team, same so team. What are you looking for now? Um, well, <laughs> every couple of months I decide I'm done acting. <laughs> yeah. This is this is just you know me. This has been my thing for decades now. I always am looking for a way out. But but <laughs> um, I don't know. I do love it. I do love it. Um, just original ideas, and that's why I liked Ryan so much because it was not only I think. Is he a very original filmmaker? But it was his script, and 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 uh, it's why I did Snowpiercer. You know, any any storyteller who has a very strong preference. I like people with strong preferences, no matter what they are, in any capacity, even even outside of this industry. Um, I think that that's something to offer and, and to explore. And um, I think maybe in TV right now that that those creative minds are given a bit more freedom. You know, because again, they're not beholden to the box office numbers, and they don't have to do all these, um, you know, testings. And you know, it, it feels like movies sometimes get inundated with studio notes, and all of a sudden, what was once an original idea becomes boiled down to the lowest common denominator. And then you have no one's favorite movie, but everyone's like lukewarm movie. Um, and I think that's why people are maybe turning away and looking to things like streaming service shows that, that actually are uh, innovative and, and taking risks. Um, but I still think that's available in film. I mean, look at, look at Marriage Story. That's, that's a really unique film. That yeah, nothing I mean, like I'd ever seen. There's definitely a place for I mean, even when I had read the script for Jojo Rabbit, um, I had never seen anything like, like it before. What was it like working with Taika? It was great. It was, I had a, I, I love Taika. I love Taika. I too. can't say enough about the guy. Yes, I I love Taika Waititi. He is uh, incredibly he is a like, unicorn. infectious. Yeah, he's I, a, I cannot get enough of him. personality. Yeah. He is um, he's a wellspring of ideas and one-liners and just uh, he's just like a creative like one of those genius like once in a lifetime people that come around and we were in go keep going no what you were in what well, i was in toronto doing the festival and he crept in once while i was doing an interview and he came to say hello to me and tripped and fell and took down the whole set <laughs> <laughs> it was just oh he's so endearing only Taika, yeah. yeah he's 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 really he was wonderful to work with and uh you know he wrote this script i guess like 10 years ago um and strangely enough it feels like Jojo Rabbit's more, even more, it's actually kind of sad, but it like, seems more relevant now than it was 10 years ago. Um, and I think, you know, if you see it, it'll, you'll understand why it's why that's a sad th fact. Um, but it, you know, that film um, found its way, you know, through Fox Searchlight, which is, you know, has a history of just making really cool, interesting, Stuff they have, they're they're not. They don't shy away from that. Studio doesn't shy away from stuff that's subversive, and you know they're happy to give it a theatrical release, and they believe in it. And I think there is still there's room for independent film for sure. I mean, yeah. I I think people want um, they want diversity. They want to see different kinds of things, and they want to see different stories that represent them, and and different actors that represent them. And I think it's you know there's definitely. Uh, there's room for original stuff, you know. It's hard to find good stuff, period. It's always been sure. that way. Yeah. Um, which is why I actually am curious about um, your kind of looking at it as a, as a director. If you are, con if that's something that continues to interest you, 
Um, or do you look for material to produce for yourself? Like, how do you, where, where is your head at with that stuff? Well, I'm dying to direct, but I don't have the courage uh, or focus to write. Um, and the hardest thing is finding material. Like, the good material isn't just, you know, sitting there untouched. So it's, it's tough to find, <clears throat> you know, when I directed, one of, the, one of the tricky things was, you know, I found some little broken bird script and I thought, oh, I can nurse this thing back to health. And, um, you know, in retrospect, uh, I, I do think even the best version of the movie I directed, there, there may still have been a ceiling based on the material. Um, and so you, you really do have, if, if it's not on the page, I, I may have been, I don't want to say naive, hopeful that I assumed we could elevate it beyond what um, the potential seemed to be on the page. Um, but but if, if, if it's not there on the page, it's probably not the right thing to, to dive into. But, but that's just it. It's hard to find those scripts, those diamonds in the rough that, that are just ready to go that no one else has taken already.